Okay, so we're going to do test statistics. This is not looking up p-value. This is not determining whether or not something is significant or not significant. This is literally looking up the value, calculating the value that you use to look up on a table. That can be done at a separate time and we can go over that. This one specifically now is the different ways you can calculate a test statistic. So we're gonna do four different types. Is it let in random people to Zoom? We can do proportion, which we will need p, uh, p hat, p, q, and n, and all that to give us a z score. So p, our proportion scores will give us a z score. So we use this when we have percentages. So p hat, so this is uh, values uh, info slash formula. So I'm going to break this into information. So a little bit about what I'm looking at, if it's applicable, and a formula when I get down to like this guy right here, the Z score, which will be the, the formula. So P hat is industry standard. I put this in quotation marks because uh, it's basically what you say. Um, so in this case, I will say that like nine, uh, I want to say that 92% of people have power steering in their car. Okay, I just pull a number out of my head. So that is, somebody says it, it's true. Proportion is I did a survey. I went out and asked everyone coming out of the parking garage if they have power steering or not. And then I throw out everyone who said, what's power steering? Because how many people knows what power steering is? Trust me, you would know if it goes out. It's, it's not that fun. And let's say there is 85% of people who say they had power steering. This is one minus P. So just the number of people who don't have whatever P is. And this is how many people you guess. So let's say I got bored and went up there and actually asked 50 people. I just put that right there. So our Z score for this one would be P hat minus P divided by square root of P times Q divided by N. So P hat minus P or basically the difference from what people say versus what I found out over the square root of I'm going to do this twice because I do it this way. P times Q divided by N. And yes, it's my support. And that gives us our test statistic. From here, I can go onto the Z table and look it up or I think I can look up p-value from the z-score. If I can, hey, look, bonus. Uh, norm, uh, no, it's not norm. No, I can do test. I'll look, it, I'll look it up later. I will see if I can do this up later. I just want to make sure I get through the test statistics. If I can look it up, great. If not, we'll talk about it later. But this, is how you look up proportions. So this, these three down here, sorry, these two and this are what you need to have found. So you need to have, uh, I don't know where this went, the P hat, which is once again your industry standard, you need to have P 
and you had to have n, and everything else can be calculated from that. So that's how you find a proportion. So the next one would be mean u. And this is if I have uh, I don't know my standard deviation. Um, if I don't know my population, what's going on? So this would be no population standard deviation or small sample size. So this is if I have less than 30 individuals. So for this one, I need to have my X bar, so once again, So this is my value. So this is my mean of my sample. Then I need mu, mean of my population. So in this case, I would say, what's the average height of males? I, the industry standard, basically the worldwide would be, uh, there are about 68 inches. My X bar is if I sampled 20 people and on average we got, let's say 72 inches because I sampled it. What else we need is S, which is our sample standard deviation. So let's say that if I had a uh, standard deviation, I went out, calculated everything of 1.2 inches. And then I need N, which is how many samples. And I said I got 20. So for this, I need all four of these. And from this, I will get a t-score. So the formula for this, x bar minus mu over uh, standard deviation divided by square root of n. Kind of simple. You can see the same basic pattern happen here. X bar minus mu, p hat minus p. You take the industry, what you expect to find, minus what you sample for. And you still have kind of the same thing here where you have n on the bottom. So we have this value minus this value. Let me put them in parentheses because I don't trust them. divided by standard deviation divided by the square root of a sample size. And that gives me my T value. From here, in order to look up your P value from your table, you will need to find your degrees of freedom, which is this minus one, your numbers minus one. And so you use that which you may be able to t look up this way. I would guess that we might be right. I'll check. So if this works, and I will double check, it's t dot this, and then I have to do my t value, comma, my degrees of freedom, which is the one right below it, 
comma, and then I'd put in false because I need to make sure it's a probability and not a density function. Yay. And yes, I will post this. You can copy and paste it. Um, it will make life easier to not have to run behind, I'm sure. Um, that, and I will say the most important thing of this before I go into the last two is being able to interpret what's going on, not so much the math behind it. And I will kind of do my rant based on that. So the next one I'll do right below it is mean you, but instead we have, uh, so so the population is known or and greater than 30. So the end greater than 30 means that we can follow something, we know it, you love it, the central limit there. We can assume that we have enough to dictate a normal distribution. And if we have that, then we can assume that we'll follow that normal bell curve. And what we have is normal. And that's what the Z distribution is, is that normal distribution. So given the fact that if we have the population standard deviation, or if we have a big enough sample size, it should follow a z-score. So we can use that instead of a t-score, which is easier to look up. So for this, once again, x-bar, u, we have the pop sd, the sigma, and m. So kind of the same thing. Except this is the population standard deviation. And we calculate a z score. And the kicker of this, so if we have if we do this, if we do say we just turned around and did the same thing, but females instead of males. So we say that. Um, we're going to test average height of females and we're going to say, does anybody know that number? I know 50 or 68 is actually the average height of males. So I'm going to guess 64. Five, five, so that's 65. I was pretty close. So 65 is the average height for females. Let's say I get 67. And I spent way too much time on this and literally like checked everyone coming in and out of the building all day with, a, with an electronic pipe fighter. And then, you know, fought off all the people asking me what in the world I'm doing. Now, because I have such a large sample size, I'm going to assume that my standard deviation is relatively small, probably would be. So we have about a half an inch standard deviation. So the z-score is calculated much the same way as the t-score above. We have x-bar minus mu divided by the pop standard deviation over the square root of 10. So almost exactly the same way. Actually, I could probably copy this and we'll do the same thing. F14 minus F15 divided by F16 divided by Yep. So as you can see, I have a really, really big z-score. And it's because I have a really, really big sample size and a really small population standard deviation. So I'm about to do one of my mini rants and why I really bugs me whenever you have large sample sizes. And my call to, if you go to grad school, please build models, do not do T tests or Z tests because they are pointless. If I am given a big enough sample size, I can make anything significant. Like 
let's say it's 66.9. And I have, so if I look at the same thing up here, to do right here. Oh, this is not up. Uh, I'd have to look it up. So I would guarantee you, that's a different score, that this right here would be significant. Even though my mean and my x bar aren't that close, which is kind of messed up. Uh, probably would be better if I get this way. So let me just that one. Even something that small, probably significant. That I have, you know, kind of issues with that. So, is it significant? Yes. Is it practical? Maybe not. So, that's what that is. So, that's how to do the meet. How to do chi squared. This is given. So, we are doing. Uh, you have to have normal distribution. If you don't have normal distribution, you can't do chi squared. Right. Oh, on this one, you need to provide those four. So, for this, you need to have N. And S and population SD. So you need both the population and sample standard deviation to do a chi square from just the numbers. So this, once again, sample size. This is your sample standard deviation. Population and deviation. So what we're what this does is essentially ends up telling us whether or not we get what values we expect, and we're calculating a chi squared. Let me change this to chi squared. So if we have the same two hundred, say two hundred people. Uh, the sample standard deviation, let's, let's do, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. So if I have a sample standard deviation of 1.2, the population standard deviation of 0.6, do I see the numbers that I expect to have? So the formula for this is n minus 1 times s squared. All that is divided by top SD squared. So this is sample. So I would take, I need to stop saying so. Just realizing it's going to bug me now. I've been saying that a lot. Your sample size. Minus one. We take that times your sample standard deviation squared, and then you divide everything by your population standard deviation squared, and that gives you your chi squared. To look this up, you will you should need your uh, pop, uh, your degrees of freedom. Your degrees of freedom. Let me see if I, there's something there specific on there. Uh, it's contingency tables. No. Your degrees of freedom for this, it can be different, it is usually n minus 1. So it would be. 
this. And this one. So the information it provide are these three. So that's how we calculate all the test statistics, pretty much for the whole chapter. Now the next thing we care about, so I've already done it here, is the p-value. So I'm going to look up the p-value from z-statistic in Excel real quick. Okay. I have that. Oh, so to find the p-value, this is equal to norm dot dist of our at our value, and then we put in zero and one and true. And that will give us our p-value. And whether or not it's going to be significantly different or not. Wait, that looks weird. That looks better. Oh, I see. It is true and it's one long message. So to do this, this will give you the number, how far it is on the right percentage, how many things are behind it. To get the p-value, you'll have to do one minus, and that will tell you how much is to the right. And the fun thing about Excel is if you wanted to, and I do, I can go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, and say if this is less than, let's say, I don't know, 0 0.05, which is the normal thing that we care about, it will highlight things if they're significant. And I can make another rule and say, highlight cell rules greater than, uh, I, have to go to, I have to go into multiple rules. So conditional formatting, uh, new rule. Uh, I have that one. So I would like one, I can make another one. Initial formatting, highlight cells greater than 0.05, and then I change it to like yellow. And then if I change any of this, It will change to whether it's significant or not. So, the other one was what? Red and red. So that you can kind of cheat around with it. Because I like having color. And you can do this with all these. So you can, well, once again, conditional formatting, highlight cells, greater than 0 0.05. Let's do uh, room fill. And then once again, if we do formatting how it sells less than five red text. And it would just pop it up. So the same formula I use over here. I can use down here. And it even copies the rules. So P value. So it would tell me what's going on. So if I even had that 200, that was 65 and 68, that's a big difference. You can get a p-value of zero. It basically means, yeah, something's going on. 
uh, for hi squared. I test. Oh, they're doing it. They're doing something different. I don't have that. Yes, I know how that one works. I could literally run it myself. Oh. Dot chi squared dist right, where I can put in my chi squared and then my degrees of freedom. And it would give me my p value. So, again, because I like to, greater than 0.05, make it green. Okay. And less than zero five. Oddly enough, I think that's like a vast majority of your next homework. All on like one spreadsheet. And I think this was on your master spreadsheet, but I like I said, there are times I don't like it. Here's literally everything in one go. Uh, whichever one you want to use, go for it. If you want to use a computer, like there's other programs like um, Jump, R, Python that will do this. I don't care. However you want to do it. Uh, we'll see if this, does, do they get, uh, we'll do with these. And then I'll look next week to see if we actually get into data. And whether or not we do, I'll go ahead and start doing when you have data. Um, so what I probably should do is talk a little bit about what uh, these are and what these aren't. So what we're doing here, and this will all depend on your field, what you're doing and everything else. But this is probably the reason this right now why you're taking statistics they are these guys. Because they, everyone assumes that these are the most important things for you to learn. And almost every paper that you have to read, especially if you go into nursing, will have these in them. And I dislike them because they over rely on them. Based off of literally this right here. If I make a big enough sample size, once again, I'll just find differences. That's just how it works. So that aside. Uh, what we're doing, and the, this is also where English comes in, and this is where everyone trips up. And if they get, if you're really good at math, you've been doing along great, and then you get into this section, and you have to start talking about words. And there's very specific words that they care about. And, and this is, and I hate, and you can kind of tell I'm a math person. I don't like English as a subject. I don't like grammar. I make no. No, no hiding about it. Yeah, I would like to be able to read your sentence, your, your words, and understand them, but I'm not going to run it through Grammarly to see. I will like look at the lopes right to make sure you didn't blatantly cheat, but I'm not. I'm going to ignore everything they do for grammar report because I hate it. 
personally. I just don't like what it does. So don't cheat. If you're gonna cite from somewhere on the internet, cite them. That's all you have to do for me. I don't care. Um, but there are words I care about. And I'm about to tell you the words I care about. So let me actually get into They are not letting me have Google Docs for shame. So let's talk about how you set up hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing. The idea of a hypothesis testing is that we are disproving what we don't want. So the whole point of everything I just did on that Excel cell spreadsheet is to try and disprove something you don't want. Because in math, and if you've ever sat through a math like proof, you can't prove anything. You have to show enough evidence to show that the alternative just doesn't make sense. That's what math is. So if you ever thought about transferring to math, that's what you'd have to look forward to. So the null hypothesis, otherwise written as H naught, this is what you don't want. So in my mythical example I gave of heights, I will say that the H naught, the null hypothesis, is that the mean of males is 68 inches. That's what I'm trying to disprove. That the sampling of people here is going to be greater than, less than, or different than the average of males. So that's what I want to disprove is the null hypothesis. Then we have the alternative hypothesis. HA. You can't say anything as true in stats. We can wink suggestively at it, which is what we do, but we can't say it's true. <clears throat> this is okay. Remember, what was it like sixth and seventh grade when they really started hitting word problems hard? Yeah, this is word problems. Uh, sorry. Um, so we have three types we have greater than and or not equal to. Those are the three, and you know the words because you've taken basic math to what they say. So, and this, by the way, is where you can start becoming really unethical. Um, when you make this null and alternative hypothesis with whatever you do, you're supposed to do this before you collect a single data point. Because if I change this, I change the whole premise of what I'm actually looking for. So, that aside. So, I could have mean of males is greater than 68 inches. Mean of males is less than 68 inches. Mean of males is not 68 inches. Those are the three ways you can do it. And this is how you do it with words. Uh, because sometimes they'll ask you for words. Uh, to do this with symbols, mu is equal to 68 inches. It's, I, I'm not gonna look up the mu symbol on word. It's the, 
this guy. Okay, I'm not gonna look it up. It's there somewhere. I'm just gonna write out mu because it saves time. So over here, mu greater than ugh, 68 inches, mu less than 68 inches. Oh, I hear what does that. Mu not equals 68 inches. And what you are doing is you're doing a different type of test. It's going to be left tail, right tail, or two tail. So if it's greater than 68 inches, this is a right. Because on the normal distribution, what you're doing, let me actually get up because you're going to the right on the z-score, right, or the t-score. You're going to the right side, so it's a right tail test. These are left tails because you're doing the same thing but you're looking for a small number. You're going this way. And this last one is a two tail. So you don't really care as long as it's far enough away from the mean. It is easier to reject a null hypothesis on a one tail test than a two tail test. So it will be easier statistically to do those. It is harder to do a two tail test. So how you ask the question is kind of really important. Um, when you do this, I would, the easiest way to do which way you're doing is subtract your mean from your mu. And if it's a right tail test and you're positive, you're going the right direction. And if it's a left tail test and it's negative, you're going in the right direction. Um, oh, and then here is what happens. So you can set p values based on different criteria. And I will post this today too, even though it's really skinny notes, at least it's something, right? So p values are set by your field. I think I may have talked about this, I may have not. So if I can let's see, insert table field. So If I'm working in, say, if I have a p-value of 0.1, really bad, I know, this is a field like ecology. Uh, because I can't go out and make another mountain. I can't go out and make another stream. I may have a very limited sample size, so the field in general will allow a larger p-value than what normally is. 0 0.05 is almost every field. This is your default. If you are running on one of these, you don't know which one to use, and it doesn't fall under any of the things I want to talk about here, it's 0 0.05. 0 0.01, this is where you start talking about health and medicine. Because when you start dealing with people's health and people's medicine, if you make a mistake, you kill people. So kind of important to make sure what's happening is actually happening. And then there's this guy. 
0.001 genetics. Because if I start messing with people's genetics and things go badly, really, really bad things happen. So we want to be extra special, we sure that that happens. So that's a very quick overview. There could be more fields that fit other places, but in general, that's what we generally care about. And even stuff like this, there's stuff we can do to p-values to make sure they are, it's like Bonferroni correction, I think is the name of it, but you guys don't do them, don't worry about them. If they pop up, I would be utterly shocked in here because it's like the second semester of my grad statistics class that popped up. So I don't think they'll be here. Um, so the actual p values. So if you get a value greater than this, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the fancy words. What it means. What I wanted to prove isn't true. I wanted to find something different. I didn't find it different. That's what I got. Nothing significant. If you get a value equal or less, we reject the null hypothesis meaning the alternative. What that means is I found something, what I want is true, now I'm going to talk about it, essentially. But you can't say it's true. You have to say you reject the null hypothesis, and since the only thing left besides the null hypothesis is the alternative hypothesis, then it must be true. Okay. Any questions on that? Does that help clarify in like more simple English what the heck is going on? Can you tell this is more of my wheelhouse because I've done this a lot more? Okay, like I said, this is stuff, if you use statistics past this class, this is probably what you're going to use. Even here, and we'll get to them later, these guys are not usually done this way. Yes. So, like, for a multiple question, is that like to reject it or fail the null hypothesis? Yeah. To reject the null hypothesis means your p value would be less than your threshold. If you fail to reject it or whatever. And here's the issue I have with all these other things is people use different words for the same thing. You either, if it's less than 0 0.05, whatever the null hypothesis is, whatever words they use, that one isn't true. And if that happens, the only thing left is the alternative hypothesis. And that's what you're talking about. Kind of weird, but I don't know what exact verbiage they use. Uh, that's what I use growing up, or not growing up, going through grad school, going through college. Um, other people will use different things. Uh, usually with this, you will get a two-way table, and there's math you have to do, and I can go over that there. I actually kind of like doing chi-squared. I might bring in some M&Ms or something and show you how to actually do a chi-squared because I like that lab. It's my favorite lab from biology because everyone gets to eat M&Ms. Uh, any other questions as it's almost been our hour and everyone wants to go home? And I'm about to go eat a poke bowl. Anyone? Okay, in that case, I'm going to go ahead, stop this, stop sharing, and